One day, they got into another argument about calling names. The first thing I saw was the Bulgarian climbing off his machine and marching up to Pete like he meant business. This time I thought there'll be a good fight. You will take it back this time too, said the Bulgarian. Take what back, said Pete. He acted like he was surprised. The name you just now called me? What name, said Pete. You know the, the name what it was, said the Bulgarian. You called me the son of a Bulgarian bastard. You're crazy, said Pete. I was talking to the machine. You called the machine that, said the Bulgarian. That name you called the machine? Sure, said Pete. You see, I wasn't sure if that name would fit you. You ain't the son of a Bulgarian bastard, are you? The Bulgarian lost all his sap. His big hands hung loose at his sides, and by the looks on his face, you could tell he was trying to figure out something that was too hard. But after he got back on his machine and started working again, and the levers clicked under his hands, his looks changed. His eyes were like a piece of cold Vesemer steel that had just cut. That's just cut. Two days after that, or maybe three, I was chipping the scale off a big block of malle malleable, and Pete was standing with his back to the machine, and he was looking at a blueprint on the table where there were some dinner buckets standing, and I was sitting down, taking it easy, and just by accident, I looked at one of the wheels on the carriage of the machine, and I thought it was moving a little. But if it was, it was going so slow, I wasn't sure if it was moving or not, and I kept looking at it, and pretty soon it got sort of like playing a game with myself, and then I looked up to see what the Bulgarian was doing, and it was plenty. He was standing with his hands on the levers, and you could see the white on his knuckles, and not a muscle was moving, and he had his eyes fastened on Pete, like a bird dog that smells a partridge in the dead leaves six feet in front of his nose. Then I looked at the arm, and I thought it was moving. I thought it was coming toward the floor, but if it was moving, it was coming so slow I couldn't be sure. Then I looked at the hand, and I saw the big claws slowly starting to open. The skin got tight on my head, and every hair felt like it was a pin sticking into my scalp, and I let out a yell. The hand! Pete turned around and looked at me and came over to me where I was working, and he said, What's the matter with you? I don't know, I said. I guess I'm getting the willies. He looked at me for a minute, and I guess he thought I was crazy, and then he walked away, and I looked at the Bulgarian, and he had his head stuck in the toolbox, digging around in his tools. First I thought I'd tell Pete all about it, and let him know what I saw, and say to him, Pete, for the love of Mike, don't ever turn your back on that machine when the Bulgarian is on it, because you can, can't never tell what that crazy guy might do to you, might do when he gets his hands on those levers, and the juice gets into his brains. But I kept putting it off, and I thought maybe the other fellows would hear about it, and think I was crazy, and after a couple of days, I wasn't sure if what I had seen really happened, or if it was just my imagination, so I kept the best thing, to, so I thought the best thing to do would be to keep still, and so I kept my mouth shut and said nothing. A couple of weeks later, they rolled in a piece of steel that must have weighed seven or eight tons. It was square, and it had to be hammered into, sh into a shape that looked something like a mud turtle. They were going to make it into a die block for a machine that was supposed to press the whole top of an automobile out of one piece of sheet iron. We don't want no deep flaws in this piece, the superintendent said to Pete. The job is experimental, and by the time it's milled down, there'll be at least a couple of thousand dollars against it. In the morning, Pete put the steel to soak in the fire, and after lunch, he got out the blueprint to study it. And at three o'clock, the steel was hot and ready to go under the hammer. Pete gave the Bulgarian some signals. He jerked his left thumb in a backward direction, jerked his head to one side, screwed up one corner of his mouth, pointed a finger at the furnace, made a motion with his thumb toward the hammer, and spit out a long, thin stream of tobacco juice. If he had hollered out those instructions so that you could have heard him above the roar of the fires, what he told the Bulgarian would have been something like this. Come on, you foreign bastard. Get your finger out of your shirt tails and get that rig down here and pull that steel out of number two and put it under the hammer, and I hate your guts. 
Of course, there were some small and fine meanings in Pete's signals that fellows like us didn't always get. You had to be good at it, like the Bulgarian, to get everything. The machine rolled down the track, and Pete threw in the switch, and the motor pulled the heavy brick door of the furnace up to the ceiling. The heat was like a rolling white fog inside, and the Bulgarian crouched low behind the isinglass shield, and the long arm reached in for the steel, and the heat was just right, for the for, but the steel was heavy. The Bulgarian swung it around to hammer, and Pete was standing in place, and the hammer was warming up, but not coming all the way down. The Bulgarian figured that Pete was going to round off four corners of the block against the flat base of the opposite side, but Pete touched the two opposite corners of the steel with his long rod, and then made an up-and-down slicing motion with his hand that meant that he was going to flatten one corner and make it into the base, and that he would, and that he wanted the block, head, the block held in such a way that two corners of it would be in a perpendicular line with the stroke of the hammer. The Bulgarian saw right then that he was going to have a tough job. He raised the block to the anvil, but at the first blow of the hammer, the hand began losing its grip on the steel, and he lowered it to the floor to get a new hold, and Pete motioned for him to get it up there and stop fooling around with it because they were losing the heat, but the Bulgarian got down off the machine and came up to Pete and said, Why do you not do it the other way? It, it is to make it hard for the machine that you do it this way. Get that steel up there, Pete hollered at him. I'll let you know when I need you to tell me how to run my own job. The Bulgarian climbed back to the machine, and he started to fool around with the steel, trying to get a good hold on it so that he could set one corner down on the anvil. And he picked it up, and then he let it down again on the floor, and it was heavy, and above the click of, the, of his levers, you could hear the loud grind of the gears and the whine of the motors, like they were doing something they didn't want to, and Pete was standing there with a mad look on his face, and a bunch of visitors came, stringing in and stopped in the aisle and watched Pete and the Bulgarian. Pete saw there were a couple of good-looking dames in the crowd, and he was anxious to show what he could do with the hammer, and he gave the Bulgarian a signal. Make it snappy and get it up there. But the Bulgarian never took his eyes off the hand. He got it up there, but before he had it square on the anvil, Pete sent the big hammer down, and the blow was off-center, and it started slipping again, and the Bulgarian let out a yell. I can't hold it! And by the sound of his voice, you'd think he was trying to hold his own soul, and that it was just about to drop off down into hell. He was far enough away from the steel, not to get much of the heat, but his hair was stringy and wet and hung over his eyes, and the sweat ran down his face and the front of his neck. Once more he let the steel down on the concrete, and he handled the levers not with slick easy motions, but hard and fast, and every minute it looked like something would go to pieces or snap. They were losing the heat, and the steel was getting dark on the edges, and Pete hollered out, Get up there and hold it, or say you can't do it and get off the job! The Bulgarian grabbed it again and stuck it under the hammer, and while he was still turning it a little, trying to get it just right on the anvil, Pete tripped the hammer and it came down under a full head of steam and hit one of the claws on the hand. The Bulgarian let out a yell as if he'd been shot. He loosened his grip and backed away from the hammer and let the steel tumble down on the floor. Pete stripped off his goggles and brought his two hands up together and jerked 